I don't know how many of you came from the old country philosophy that you don't spare the rod. <clears throat> that if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. And of course, uh, the Bible has something to say about that. If you've ever read your Bible on the subject, it is very clear that discipline is extremely important for the child. True or false? Except for all of you who think Dr. Spock is more inspired than the Bible. So I'd like to use this corner of our beginning here for the boys and girls through the eyes of the parents. There was a study made. There have been many studies made, but there was a study made in which the philosophy of three types of parents was compared and uh, was followed through in the research as to which is the most successful. The three types were discipline with love, discipline without love, and permissive. Permissive. And after this had been carefully followed through for years, the experts came up with the realization and admitted so by the parents that the most effective way to relate to your child is discipline with love. The second most effective is permissive. And the third, the bottom of the heap, was discipline without love. Very interesting. You'd expect permissive to be the bottom of the heap in terms of effectiveness. So it is better to be permissive than to discipline without love but it is best, and this, of course, is your Bible, to be a parent who believes in discipline with love. Well, how do you do that when you think that a child is going to think you don't love them when you discipline them? The Bible says don't hesitate to discipline your child. He will not die. And some of us grew up in the kind of homes where uh, the discipline was very strong. But the love was always bigger than the discipline. And that is what makes the difference. So if there is a boy or a girl here today who sometimes has been unhappy because you received discipline, or shall we use the more common word, you had a licking or you were spanked, or your uh, parent took you out of church because you were disturbing the church service, and you found out it was more fun to stay in church than to stay out, like one parent told me lately. Don't feel bad about it as long as you know that your parents still love you. That's the only condition. And those students and young people who grew up in a disciplined home can be very thankful as long as the love is bigger than the discipline. I don't know how many boys and girls are going to stand and sing the doxology at this point. But let's take a look at it because it shows up in our study for today. Numbers, the 21st chapter. Numbers 21. To pick up the story where we left off last time. The children of Israel had come up for the second time to the borders of the promised land, Kadesh Barnea. Once again, they had lost faith or didn't have faith, and they turned away. Moses lost patience, beat on the rock with a stick, 
and then began a two-year detour around Edom. This detour around Edom had some interesting experiences from which we can learn today. Beginning with verse 4, Numbers 21. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. The soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Seemed like uh, King James and his men could have done a little bit better with the language there. I don't know. But the soul of the, dis of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Sometimes you might wake up to the realization that you are much discouraged because of the way. Well, what do you do? Verse 5, this is what the people did. They spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. You know... <clears throat> When people become loathing of angels' food, what's wrong? Is it the food or the people? Verse 6, which some people might prefer, would not even be in the Bible. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Well, uh, why would some people just assume that text not be in there? Because uh, they want a kind God who never disciplines, who is permissive, who never causes trouble, never brings trouble never hurts anybody. They think that that's the only kind of God that you can love. But have you noticed that the parents who are permissive end up with children that don't love them? Have you ever noticed that? That's true. You can watch it and follow it through in human history and case histories, one after another. The person who is not disciplined ends up not loving and respecting authority or parents. So when we campaign strongly for discipline, it is because we are interested in our children, our young people. Well, uh, some people say, oh, but the Lord got rather tough here. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And I suppose that we could uh, do a little bit of speculation on this. There are herpetologists who have done some research on it. They've discovered that there are plenty of serpents in the wilderness where the children of Israel wandered. Plenty of serpents. Enough serpents to do the job. They've also discovered that in the wilderness around Edom, where this detour was taking place, there was an extra supply of serpents. Now, as we go back, we discover that according to God's promises and his care for his people, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, that uh, God had protected his people from danger. In fact, for the 40 years, not one person had been afflicted with typical sickness, disease, illness, but God never forces his protection or his blessings on anybody. So when a person decides that he's going to, through lack of faith, gripe and complain and focus in on himself, and this goes on about so long, apparently God simply withdraws his protection. This could be one explanation. God does not push his protection on anybody. And when he withdrew his protection because of the griping and the complaining, 
those snakes were right there to do the job. Well, they say, what about the devil? <clears throat> Maybe he brought the snakes. Well, I'm sure that the devil was happy to get involved in the picture because he enjoys seeing people die. You go water skiing on Sabbath or you go snow skiing on Sabbath and you break your leg and you say, oh, I broke my leg and the Lord did it to me. If I hadn't have been skiing on Sabbath, the Lord wouldn't have broken my leg. No, no, back again to the point that God doesn't force his blessing on anybody. So we say, uh, then you're the one that broke your leg. No, probably the devil was happy to break your leg because he knew that the usual practice would be to blame God for it. And he loves to break legs and he likes people to blame God for it. It's all there together. It makes sense if we understand the great controversy. But even if God did send the serpents, not just withdrew his protection, I'd like to ask you a question. Do we have enough evidence of the love of God? Do we have enough past history of God's concern for his people and his willingness to be on our side, to not have to throw it all overboard when discipline takes place? In other words, the Bible makes it clear that God is a God of discipline, but isn't it true that the ideal situation for relating to anybody exists with God? His love is always greater than his discipline. Now, the person who hasn't seen this or noticed this will simply accept God as a God of discipline and forget about the love he is going to walk away from the whole thing. We know that. And so we find ourselves often in the category of the intellectual who loves to ask why. You have all of the newsman's questions that people deal with in terms of religion. You have uh, the people who ask what, what to do and what not to do, and they tend to be the legalists. You have the people who ask when, and they're the ones who are interested in eschatology, closing events, when is it going to happen? You have the people who ask which, and they're the students of world religions. And you have the people who ask how, and they're the ones who are interested in righteousness by faith in theory. And you have the people who ask who, and they're the ones who focus on Jesus and righteousness by faith experientially. And you have the people who love to ask why. Why? It's the favorite question of the intellectual, the smart people. Uh, who really don't like to do anything unless they know why. Why? And uh, some people will go into their graves asking why. There are some intellectuals who are pretty smart, but they're not smart enough to realize how dumb they are. And that is a problem that shows up in this story. But we have our modern facsimiles of this story even today. Now, when Moses went to the Lord and prayed for the people, after they had said, we have sinned, in verse 8 it says, The Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. That seemed like a stupid thing to do. Come on, all of you intellectuals. Why make a serpent? I mean, in the first place, people are dying even now. The poison has entered their system. It's doing its work. You don't have time to get the craftsman that you know has the knowledge to help you do this and spend the time forming a serpent out of brass and getting it up on a pole. Let's have some answers now. And then why a serpent? That seems foolish. Serpent has always represented sin and Satan and the devil. The intellectual who wants to know why, he can twist his brain out of shape on this one. What a foolish thing to do. 
But Moses was not in the habit of asking why when God spoke. And this is one of the evidences of the great man that he was, the man of faith. When God spoke, he obeyed. Remember the little boy or girl out in the back, three or four years old, begins to rain. Mother leans out the door and says, come in. And they say, why? Because it's beginning to rain. Why? Because there are clouds. Why? Why do I have to come in? You'll get wet. Why? Because rain makes you wet. Why? And you'll get pneumonia. Why? And by this time, the child is soaking wet. The other parent leans out the door. It's beginning to rain. Come in. Why? Because mother said so. Now, the child who has that kind of parent can be very thankful. Am I right or wrong? And I'm glad I had that kind of parents. God says, make a snake. Put it on a pole. Moses doesn't ask why. He does what God says. Why? Because he had learned that God has a good track record. You can trust God. Now, a crisis doesn't change you. A crisis reveals which way you're already going. The snakes that came in the camp and caused panic throughout the congregation of Israel didn't change anybody. It only showed which way they were already going. It happens that way in your own life. It happens that way in the church, in the denomination. Uh, we were away last weekend up in Idaho for a weekend with a church and someone made a comment during the weekend that really registered with me. They got into this theological crisis and some of the things that had been rocking the church lately. And someone said, God has so arranged things that the person who has never been happy in the church can find an easy out today and can check out. God, in his love, has allowed things to happen and perhaps even arranged some of it so that the person who has always wanted out can get out. Doesn't that show his love? Shows his love in more ways than one. You know it's going to happen when it's all over? That the church is going to be purified and going to have power like it never had before. That's what's going to happen. The people who griped and complained about the food and all the rest of it, they had no reason to make trouble. Already trouble was fast approaching. The disciples on the lake who were complaining and griping about Jesus and how he didn't go and become king down in Jerusalem, they had no reason to cause trouble. Already trouble was fast approaching, a storm down from the mountains that whipped the lake into a frenzy of fury. Well, <clears throat> Moses, true to his usual style, he prays for them. He did what God said, verse 9, Moses made a serpent of brass, put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now you explain that to me, you scientists. You naturalist, you intellectual, explain that to me. Let's spend some time on that. Why? Why? Maybe we could take until this evening on why. I don't know. All I know is that it says that that's what happened. Do you believe it? Do you believe what your Bible says? You know, I appreciate Christian education. Among other reasons, here's one. The student that I know who went to a public school. And the teacher stood up one day and told the story of the flood. And when he finished, he said, how many of you believe that? And uh, 
Two or three hands went up, among them my student friend. And then he laughed and made fun and ridiculed him. Then he uh, paused for a moment, told another story about Jonah and the whale. And when he finished telling it, just like the Bible told it, how many of you believe that? <clears throat> there were less hands that went up this time. Only my friends. Then he zeroed in on him and poked fun and ridiculed him. Made him look like a fool in front of the class. Then he told the story of the snakes. And he finished that story. He said, how many believe that? What would you do if you were that student? I went to San Francisco State College one summer. Out of a large class, there were two of us in the class who were Christians, Presbyterian boy and I. One day, after I'd heard so much about evolution and science and philosophy, I got up and made a religious speech. It was a speech class. And when I'd finished, the professor got up and he said, the other day I heard Billy Graham on the radio, and if I ever heard an income poop, that was him. And Venden sounds just like him. And then they went off for a coffee break, and I sat alone. I began to appreciate Christian education. Do you know the difference? It's a big difference. I was glad when you came back in halfway through the coffee break, and he said, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Keep going the way you're going, he said. It's all right. But there's a different atmosphere. Do you believe this story or not? I believe it because I believe the Bible is true. And when they beheld the serpent of brass, they lived. But there were some people we find in the inspired commentary on this story who, who would not look at the serpent of brass. They wouldn't do it. It didn't make sense to them. They're the people who ask why. And they die with the realization that they were being intellectually astute, you see. You don't do something foolish like that. You choose to die instead. There were people who did that. Well, we can find in the Bible some reasons for the serpent of brass. You can go to Romans 8, verse 3, and uh, you can find an interesting clue. Romans 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. God sending his own Son in the likeness of of sinful flesh. The serpent has always represented Satan and sin. So when you have a serpent on the tree out in the wilderness, you have a symbol of Jesus who became sin for us. Second Corinthians 5, 21. He became sin for us. Now there was no poison in the serpent on the pole in the wilderness, just as there was no sin in Jesus on the cross. We also have a scientific clue. They tell me that a serpent of brass is a combination of copper and zinc. And uh, Jesus was a combination of two in one, divine and human. And even in Jesus' discourse with Nicodemus, in the famous chapter, John 3, he used it as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. For God so loved the world, then comes the verse, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, today we look back and we say, if we had been in the camp of Israel would we have looked at the serpent or not? Would we do something foolish like that kind of remedy? Or would we have been too smart to do something like that? Let me remind you of a few case histories. There are people, most of the people in the world, who believe in evolution. Why? 
because creation doesn't make sense to them. Why? Well, anybody knows that you can't make all of that in one day or one week. It would take time. But the Bible says that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. And you don't have to know why or how he did it. Oh, but they say, don't look at the snake. That's foolish to believe that way. You have Cain back in the early days. And uh, he doesn't like the idea that you bring a lamb like his brother Abel. Why bring a lamb? Why can't you do it my way and bring the fruits of my own labors? And you find Cain leaving God because it's foolish to look at the snake. It's foolish to do what God says. You have people today who say, How can one man sin and millions suffer? Why? And they walk away from God and faith and the Bible and eternal life because they don't believe in looking at snakes. But you don't have to know the reason for everything, do you? Do you have enough evidence about God to base your faith on without having to know the reason for everything? Someone looks at the story of the flood, and they say, why? And I suppose the people in the days of Noah had the same approach. They saw Noah building the ark. Why are you building an ark? Because a flood's coming. Well, how could a flood come? We don't even know what rain is, let alone a flood. And probably a flood wasn't even in their vocabulary. So why an ark? And Noah says, you don't have to know the reason. Just get on board the ark. Why? And they had plenty of smart people who could explain everything, including the animals who came in pairs and larger numbers and marched into the ark, the very thing that people wouldn't do. Why? I like the way Everson describes it. The naturalist and the scientist answers the reasons why concerning the animals. He says this is simply an innate propulsion of the animal kingdom, animated by the supreme activity of the subconscious mind and superinduced by posterior spheres of cerebral afterglow, sensitizing the scintilla of the corboreality of the brute creation, thus affecting a translocation of their materialistic concepts to more salubrious environments. And the people would uh, cock their head to one side and they say, well, of, of course, why didn't I think of that sooner? There's always someone who will give you a high-sounding explanation, you know. <clears throat> that sounds good. Why? Of course. And the one who gave the explanation and the one who got the explanation went down in the waters of the flood. But they went down, of course, intellectually astute. Please, my friend, young or old, you don't have to know all the reasons. When God says, look at the snake, then look at the snake. Naaman, Elisha says, go and wash in the Jordan River, the muddy Jordan River. Why? I've got clear rivers in my country. Don't take me into the mud, the muddy Jordan. Why? But his counselors said, don't stand around asking why. Do as the man says. And he finally did. But he didn't want to look at the snake. Someone smokes. Someone else says you're going to get lung cancer. Why? Why? And they go around looking for a doctor who smokes four packs a day. Because you're more comfortable that way. Two young people who don't believe what father and mother say. Or what God says about fornication. And all of the illicit world of that. And they say don't believe what they say anymore. <clears throat> it's a new age, a different time. Why, why, why? And too late they wake up to the realization of broken hearts and big trouble and complicated life situations and some in suicide. 
because they didn't believe in looking at the snake. Someone says, I'm going to marry the one I want to marry. And father and mother say, it doesn't look good. But why? Well, he doesn't have a job. And you don't know how to keep a home yet. You're not mature. Oh, but why? I want to. Don't look at the snake. And sooner or later they find themselves in big trouble again. We have all kinds of ways today of saying to ourselves and to each other, don't look at the snake. That's foolish. And people are still doing it in relationship to the story of the cross. The cross. Jesus, the only God in the history of gods who died on a cross. It doesn't make sense. That's why in the early church they called it foolishness. The foolishness of preaching the cross. And we don't understand, and people don't understand. And we're told that many are unwilling to accept Christ until the whole mystery of the plan of salvation shall be made plain to them. They refuse the look of faith, although they see that thousands have looked and have felt the value of looking to the cross of Christ. Many wander in the mazes of philosophy in search of reason and evidence which they will never find, while they reject the evidence which God has been pleased to give. They refuse to walk in the light of the sun of righteousness until the reason of its shining shall be explained. All who persist in this course will fail to come to a knowledge of truth. God will never remove every occasion for doubt. If you read it in the last chapter of the book, Steps to Christ, you'll find it stated there. God has allowed good reasons to doubt to show up in his word. So that the person who doesn't really want in can get out. But he's given us overwhelming evidence to base our faith on. God gives sufficient evidence on which to base faith, and if this is not accepted, the mind is left in darkness. If those who were bitten by the serpents had stopped to doubt and question before they would consent to look, they would have perished. It is our duty, and shall we say our privilege, first to look. And the look of faith will give us life. I'd like to invite you to make a determined decision that you are going to use your intellect and your reasoning powers on everything God has given us information on because he's the one who said, come now and let us reason together. But that you will also refuse to waste your time asking why on things he hasn't given us information on. There are some questions we might have to get answered later. Is that possible? This is no way campaigns for ignorance. It only appeals to faith. And for the person who has been tempted to doubt concerning the cross, I'd like to remind you the words of the old song. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. There's room at the cross for you. Dear Father in heaven, we'd like to thank you for all of the evidence you've given that you do love. And when we see discipline come, we know that it is from the heart of one who loves. We pray that you will help us to join these people who looked and lived
and to continue to trust you with everything you say. For Jesus' sake, amen.